Well, it's great to be here. Thanks so much for having me, Brad. And thanks everyone for coming this morning. And it was just a beautiful drive down from Bozeman today. Uh, like I said, I kind of took the Bozeman Trail, uh, now known as Interstate 90. And uh, actually, if I had taken the Bozeman Trail, it would have been a lot more direct route. Um, going through the, I think around Fort Smith is where they used to cross. And uh, of course, the Interstate takes you way around. Uh, but it was just so fun to come down on a day like today with the, you can hear the metal larks singing out, out the window and thinking about uh, this country, I uh, just can't get it off my mind. Just keep thinking about Montana, Wyoming, um, into Canada and the Dakotas. And that's where this music that, that I'm going to share with you comes from. And, uh, you know, I gave a presentation last year at Sheridan um, at the college there for the same group and was talking about medicine wheel country uh, and I think I entitled the presentation Messages from Medicine Wheel Country. And this is kind of an extension of that presentation in that this is one of the cultural art forms from this region that really uh, has been exported around the nation. And I always tell kids when I give presentations about Plains Indian style music, this is one of the few things that we don't import here in Montana. You know, uh, most everything that we're wearing or we're sitting on or that built this house or this building or whatever it came from someplace else. You know, but this music here comes from right here. And, uh, you know, think about uh, where does music come from, from around the world? And, of course, we know classical music comes from Vienna. And that's kind of the heart and soul of the classical world. Even though we find classical music around the world, that's kind of the birthplace of it and, and the place that we associate with it. There are other great forms of music, of course, what about the blues? You know, a lot of times people associate the blues with New Orleans. Um, or jazz as well. Now those are two very specific American forms of music uh, that kind of swept the nation, kind of swept the continent, and then swept the globe. And then of course later rock and roll. And so when we think about uh, forms of art that really sweep the world and just kind of, you know, go from coast to coast around the globe. Uh, it's always music. And this kind of music here has done a lot the same. You know, this kind of music is performed in Germany. Uh, there are drum groups in Germany that, that play this kind of Plains Indian style music. Uh, of course, all across the nation we have uh, uh, groups that perform this style of music, but it comes from right here uh, on the Northern Plains. And uh, I think it's very mysterious, honestly. Uh, I wish I could give you an origin story the way I could with classical music or uh, these other art forms like rock and roll or jazz about where this comes from, but it's not recorded. Uh, there is no recorded history of where these songs come from, and, and a lot of these songs, in fact, uh, cannot be written down. It would be very difficult to, to write in nomenclature how the voice is supposed to sound um, as you're singing these songs. So it's an oral tradition that kind of defies written interpretation. But that's not to say that people haven't tried to take these songs and write them down over the years. And, uh, you know, uh, one of the earliest composers, uh, I'm trying to think of his name, uh, oh man, Dvorak. Dvorak was one of the first. Uh, real uh, famous classical composers to take Native American rhythms or, or themes and kind of integrate them into a classical uh, symphony orchestra. Um, but there have been others. And uh, of course, nowadays, 
uh, we have a lot of contemporary uh, blending of, of this traditional music. Um, but in terms of where it comes from, uh, again, it's very mysterious. Um, one of the things that's uh, pretty obvious about it, though, is that it's very powerful. And uh, it kind of eclipses a lot of the other forms of uh, singing here on the continent, uh, looking from coast to coast. So just kind of reflecting here on my slide, this is Crow Fair. This is Crow Fairgrounds, here's the Little Bighorn River. And uh, right here at the heart of the Crow Fair is the powwow. And uh, you know, there's a rodeo that happens, and there's parades. But really, the powwow is the event that draws the most people. It draws the most intertribal groups. So there's uh, people from every tribe in Montana here. Uh, by the way, at Crow Fair, um, they just renovated a new dance structure. So uh, a brand new area arbor for the powwow. And uh, it's pretty big. I was just there, I saw it last week. Um, and so that's that's kind of a, probably the biggest construction project that's happened there in that town in, in quite some time. Um, and I think it's gonna be a great boon for Pro Fair. Uh, people come from all over the world to go to Pro Fair and uh, be able to come and enjoy the dances in a nice shady spot, comfortable seating, uh, it's very important. You can see the teepees all set up here. And again, this powwow is at the center of it all. And at the center of the powwow is this drum. And uh, you can see everyone sitting around it, these men here. And uh, with drumsticks like this. And uh, singing a style of song uh, that again is, is from the Northern Plains. And so uh, we're told, or I've been told, I'm sitting at the drum, uh, that's kind of the center of the world, kind of the, the center of, of uh, where everything is at, the heartbeat of the world. I first started singing this kind of music uh, when I was in high school, and then um, here over at Crow Agency, and then later on when I went to college at Bozeman, at MSU Bozeman, uh, there was an intertribal drum group there. And it was fun because uh, there were tribal members from every reservation in Montana and also Wyoming. And uh, even though all the tribes are have their own languages and have distinct cultures, this is a style of music that everyone shared. So we could all sit down, I could learn about, you know, different reservations that I'd never been to, meet different tribal people that I had never known, and uh, it was a way for tribes to come together over a common shared expression art form. So go ahead and uh, hit the next slide, please. So again, this is what I like to refer to as medicine wheel country music. And uh, all this area here is what I refer to as the medicine wheel country. Of course, we know that the, the famous bighorn medicine wheel is just, just to the west of us here. But those medicine wheels are all around uh, the northern plains. And uh, it's interesting because uh, Wherever we find the medicine wheels, we find the sun dance, and we also find this kind of music, because this is the kind of music that's sung at the sun dance. So you can't take this music away from the sun dance. You can't take the sun dance away from the medicine wheel. This music is directly connected to the medicine wheel. Uh, that's where it was originally, I think, used for the ceremony. Um, now it's become commercialized and, and we see it again across the nation, but I think it probably um, was primarily used as a ceremonial uh, form of art for this ceremony, the Sundance, 
uh, that is so closely linked to this area. Around this region, you can see the little island mountain ranges. Here's the bighorns. Uh, this is the priors. Uh, wolf teeth. Crazies. Uh, castles. Big belts. Big snowies. Judiths. Over here around Billings, you have the, uh, the Bull Mountains. All these little island mountain ranges is where you find the lodge poles. And those lodge poles are so important for Plains Indian way of life because uh, you can have lots of bison and you can make all kinds of uh, lodges, but you can't set them up without lodge poles. And so you have to have both those things in close proximity in order to live the traditional Plains Indian way of life. And so that's why this land here, this region, is so uh, closely linked to that ancient way of life because you don't see it outside of areas where you don't see lodgepole pines. You can go down to Kansas, Colorado, other Great Plains areas where there was lots of bison, but you won't find people living in lodgepole or in lodges because they didn't have access to those poles. And then, you know, you go up to Montana, you find seven reservations and 13 tribes. You come down here to Wyoming, one reservation, two tribes. Go to Idaho, two reservations, maybe three tribes. Go up to Canada, maybe two tribes, Cree and Blackfeet. You come down here, or go up to Montana, again, you see all these different tribes, all these different reservations. What was the draw? It was the island mountain ranges, the rivers, and the way of life here that made all those things come together. And so Montana, where we're at, or uh, Wyoming, here in northern Wyoming, we're on the cusp of that. This is still part of that uh, culture area with all of the rivers flowing from the, from the big corners here up into the Yellowstone. But this whole area, another way of thinking about it is a big drainage. And all the water that comes from this area all drains into this one spot. And again, that's kind of where all the bison were and a lot of the resources for folks who lived here. And it was that common area and those common resources that allowed this common art form to proliferate and flourish and get traded. So uh, go ahead and next slide, please. Again, I've kind of talked about this and spoke about it uh, in Sheridan. You can see it's pretty obvious uh, the structure of the medicine wheel, how it's so closely aligned with this medicine wheel, or uh, Sundance. This is a Blackfeet Sundance uh, photograph that was taken in the 1930s. Uh, up around Browning. But we see the same exact ceremony uh, on, on Wind River, uh, Crow, um, Lakota, and uh, but once you leave this area or head over west of the divide, for example, the Nez Pierce or uh, the tribes on the Columbia River, uh, they don't use sun dances. They don't use medicine wheels. And you know, you get over uh, past the Dakotas, no more sun dances, uh, no more lodge poles. So things seem to be correlated with one another. So I'll go ahead and ask you to the next slide. So again, it's a cosmopolitan region. These are this is a map that indicates the language families that came onto the Great Plains. And so there's Siouan, Kiowan, Catawan, Algonquin, Shoshone. Shoshone is actually an Aztecan language. Uh, Shoshone, Shoshone. And uh, the Shoshone people who live here in Wyoming, Idaho, uh, those are the northernmost representatives of that culture group, of that language family. And as you move further south, 
there's larger groups that speak that uh, Shoshone Aztecan uh, language, uh, part of that language family. So it becomes clear that almost every group that came onto the Great Plains came from a larger uh, uh, population base elsewhere, usually over around the Great Lakes or for, uh, for the uh, Salish people, it was along the Columbia River. Um, the Kootenai are the only language isolate that we know of on the Northern Plains in Montana. So it, it could be, you know, one theory is that they were the ones who started this kind of music. Because every other group that's come here to Montana and Wyoming and this area has adopted this kind of music. You might think that people would, as they move to a new region, maintain that that ancient cultural song, those songs that they brought with them from their uh, former homelands, but it appears that as people became, uh, came to occupy the Great Plains that they began singing this kind of music and uh, we, it's very difficult to find traces of uh, ancient songs now in those communities. So it's almost like this kind of music kind of eclipsed and uh, took over, uh, you know, their musical aspects of their lives. So go ahead and ceremonial way of life here on the Northern Plains, and uh, here's a picture of a sweat lodge along the Little Bighorn River. And uh, the Crow Indians do not use uh, these kinds of songs in their ceremonial sweat lodge, uh, but there are. Other tribes that do, the Lakota, the Cheyenne. Um, I know there are Blackfeet who take the drums into the sweat lodge and sing ceremonial songs in there. Go ahead. So, uh, looking at the archaeological history, we know over 13,000 years of uh, hunting, gathering, and trading has been happening here on the Great Plains. Uh, we know that from the sign language. Sign language is a cultural artifact that still remains today. Uh, it's a very sophisticated form of uh, speaking um, that actually has no words in it. Uh, it's a conceptual language was shared by 44 different tribes. And it's safe to say that all 44 of those tribes also shared this kind of music. So I think the sign language is another example of how uh, Northern Plains style music and different cultural artifacts are closely associated um, and almost inextricably linked. Okay, go ahead and hit the next slide, please. And I wanted to bring this in because uh, thinking about my tribe, uh, the Crow tribe, um, and we're pretty closely associated with this area here, and uh, we have a, a history, uh, a tribal oral history, that we came from the Great Lakes region, and we were originally agriculturalists, we were farmers. And we grew corn, beans, and squash. And uh, we came out here to Montana. The story is that uh, one of our leaders, his name was uh, No Vitals, No Intestines, had a dream about a mountain filled with um, plants that twinkled like stars. And that was the Bighorn Range. And when they got to here, the, that would be their home from now on. That, that would be their new home. And so uh, they called Clouds Peak Extended Mountain. Uh, my, my family, uh, my adopted family, the real birds, say that uh, that term extended mountain means mountain of the future. 
mountain that goes on for your future generations. So once we got here to this region, uh, we continued to try to be agriculturalists, uh, but discovered that it wasn't an ideal climate here for growing crops. And so we were, we became one of the few communities along with, I think you can, I can think of a handful of communities. Um, the Crows are one of them, the Cheyennes, uh, the Lakota, Sioux, uh, Assiniboine. Not very many, uh, maybe some others further to the east, but these are tribes and communities that went from being farmers, full-time farmers, sustained in sedentary villages year-round, to moving out onto the Great Plains and moving away from farming, abandoning farming, and com becoming complete uh, full-time hunter, gatherers, and traders. And when you look around world history, that doesn't happen. You know, you, it's always the other way. People go from hunting and gathering to becoming agriculturalists, and then they just stick with agriculture, and you can see the agricultural revolution, and then the industrial revolution, and the, the revolutions that are spawned from that. Um, and so there are, you know, there's mysteries there. I think there's questions that uh, deserve a probing, which are, why did these people make this decision? And how were they able to successfully do it in a way that uh, was seemingly uh, seamless? It was, uh, it was a transition that they made within a generation. And uh, it seems like it would be difficult to do that without uh, a lot of help from their neighbors. But the, the story of the Crow people uh, coming out here onto the Great Plains and abandoning this ancient way of life, and we still have this, so many stories and traditions that are associated with farming in our tribe, um, but yet we have no history of the music that we used to sing before we came here to the Great Plains. So all of our songs now, even the oldest songs that we know of are this style. And so again, it's one of those mysteries and also a fascinating aspect of the oral tradition, how things can change so quickly and completely uh, within a generation or two. Go ahead and uh, the next slide, please. Oh. Uh, this is a guy I grew up with, Superman. He's a rapper. Uh, he's gotten quite famous, and uh, he's been very successful. He's on tour right now, I think. He tours a lot of the year. Um, and uh, so he's quite a performer, if you haven't ever seen him. Uh, he has quite a stage show. He, he uh, is able to get the audience involved. He brings audience members up, usually kids, and they make their own little songs together. He has little, uh, like a little studio on stage that he does, and uh, you know, and then he combines it with native music, Plains Indian style music, and then of course he uses his his outfit to uh, bring another added layer of culture to what he does, and he dances traditional or fancy style, uh, fancy dancing, and. Uh, I think it's another example of how this music continues to evolve, continues to change, uh, continues to pair up with modern forms of American music. And, uh, and I think he's a great example of that. You can find his music online, um, pretty easy to find. He's done stuff with the Billings Gazette uh, that, that's free, it's free to view. And he starts off, he does like tracks, he lays tracks down for a song, so he'll start with a drum. Then he'll start recording it and he'll put it down and then move to another instrument, do something with that and then lay that down and then he'll move to another one and then pretty soon he has a whole band going. And then he starts rapping 
And then he lays one track down, and then he lays another track down, and so you see him put this whole song together in this little video. He's very talented, and skilled, and hardworking, and uh, again, I think he's a great example of how uh, you know this music continues to, to grow and change. And can you, I think that might be my last slide, but... Nope. Okay, here's a... Uh, isn't that a beautiful image? That was taken at the Madison Junction last year in August, early in the morning. And uh, that's when we had our Yellowstone Teepee Village. Uh, I was working with Mountain Time Arts on that project. So there was 13 lodges there, uh, representative, uh, representing 13 different tribes. And we had ambassadors, historians, and uh, storytellers there interacted with visitors for three days and uh, we're going to hope to do it again next summer of 2024. It doesn't look like we'll have the resources to put it together this year but last year was special because it was 150th uh, anniversary of the Yellowstone National Park and so uh, we had a lot of people coming together to uh, make that a success. Uh, so it's going to take a little while to, to make it an annual event, but that's what our goal is. And again, it's these tribes that share this, this commonality, this, this form of music. And I've got one more slide, I think. Another great photo. This was taken the night before. And so this image was taken at Gardner. And this is the lighted teepees that uh, the Pretty Shield Foundation sets up around Montana. They were at Billings for a while. During the uh, pandemic, they set them up on the rims there. And it was a pretty popular attraction for folks in Billings. They came up all winter, stopping in to see them. And then uh, they had them in Bozeman. And so uh, everyone, and both their dogs were up there uh, on Pete's Hill, they call it Pete's Hill. Uh, to visit the lodges and it was a huge smash hit there and now we're looking to set them up in Jackson Hole uh, here in Wyoming uh, in October and so we're looking to uh, put them up as part of an intertribal symposium that we're uh, I'm working with the Wilderness Society and the Wind River and Shoshone Bannock and Montana tribes and that's Pierce uh, to have an intertribal symposium on the uh, upcoming Bridger Teton National Forest 30 year management plan. So uh, you can see there was a cloudburst behind them, and it was raining and uh, hailing right down there where the other 13 lodges were. <laughs> and it was, it was quite an event, I tell you. Uh, and we had a, uh, some concerts happening, Superman performed, and, uh, we had a production called Rematriate, where we had folks from Wind River, a team of performers uh, dressed as bison and uh, doing a dance, like a bison dance. It was really, it was really fun and um, a great experience for everybody. And that was all in the Yellowstone Park. And so uh, uh, that's our goal, again, is to continue bringing voices back to the park and the public lands around the area. Um, but I wanted to uh, now give, take an opportunity to showcase a little about these songs and, and, and explain a little bit about them. So I brought my hand drum here. This is a drum that was made by my uncle Conrad Fisher. Um, and he's a Northern Cheyenne. And uh, you can see on the back here, uh, the way he styles his drum, he cuts it in the form of a morning star. So this, this symbolizes the morning star. And if you look at the Northern Cheyenne uh, flag, that's all there is, is one symbol, morning star. And uh, yesterday, it was fun for me, yesterday I was up at the Madison Buffalo Jump over on the Madison River uh, near the headwaters of the Missouri River. And I got to tell some uh, fourth graders from the Amsterdam school there uh, about uh, about the Morning Star and the story of the Morning Star. The story of the Morning Star is another one of those 
incredible stories that are shared by multiple tribes here in the region. And it's connected to a geothermal vent in the Yellowstone Park. Uh, and so the Morning Star, he's kind of like Hercules. He's a little boy. His dad is the sun, and his mom is a human. So he's got superpowers. And uh, he kills this evil buffalo bull, and he sticks him over there in the Yellowstone Park. Now it's called the Dragon's, uh, Dragon's Mount. Uh, but the traditional name for that place is uh, the, um, the Bellowing Bowl. And uh, right next to it is the Mud Pot, and that's named the, the Mountain Lion by the Crow people. Because in the story, the Morning Star uh, puts a mountain lion there uh, to watch over that buffalo bull in case it comes to life again, can jump on him and, and kill him. And so that, that story again is like these songs, it's shared uh, and it connects the sky to the land, to underneath the ground, you know, to high above the, the clouds. So just kind of bringing everything full circle. Um, I wanted to share a song that my uncle showed me uh, years ago, an uh, honor song I, I use a lot. Um, I brought two different drumsticks with me because I wanted to, to show the difference in the way they sound. Um, this one here is what you typically see most folks using, and if you bought one in the store, you'd get something like it has kind of wrapped with leather. So kind of a sharp, kind of a slap. It's not that bad, but it's still kind of a little bit of a slap to it. So this one here is what most singers prefer to use with this soft felt uh, tip. share an old honor song with you. This is a song that was uh, used to honor uh, warriors uh, in the Northern Cheyenne tribe after the Battle of the Little Bighorn. And it's still used today a lot uh, for everything from uh, honorings at powwows to uh, funerals. So, and it, the, the drum beat you'll notice is, is slower. It's more of a solemn beat. Whoever makes that song, uh, they can appoint a meaning to it. Uh, they can use it. They can tell people this is what this song is for. And then they, that song will be used in that way. Uh, sometimes people take songs and change them and 
and use them uh, for different purposes as well. Change the beat. Um, so there's that. Uh, but that song there is very ancient. It stayed the same for many, many generations. Um, and uh, again, it's an old honor song. And then I want to explain a little bit about how the song uh, works. So there's two things happening. There's a, there's a drum beat, right? And then there's a voice. And you'll notice my voice is going up and down. So it's kind of like a wave. You can see it, it would be going like that. Okay. When that wave's coming up, that's when the drumstick is going up. Hitting, your voice is going down, your voice is lowering, so they're balanced out. When you see a, a drum group singing just a, a regular song at a fast pace, and you see that song being, being sung, you'll notice it's never sung on the beat, because now it's lost the balance. But Hollywood uses that beat a lot, and you see it in Peter Pan, and a lot of movies that tend to not know anything about Northern Plains style music, so you hear a Hey ho, are you? Hey ho, are you? Hey ho, are you? You probably remember that song about hams. Uh, here. Uh, I remember when I was a little kid. From the land of sky blue waters. And I used to think, you know, that was how Indians sang, but actually that's how cavemen sang. <laughs> Plains Indians, we don't sing that way, you know, uh, otherwise dancers would be tripping and falling down. And so there's a balance with the song. If you're not familiar with this style of music and you're really um, in tune with contemporary Western style music, a lot of times the beat falls with the voice. And in rock and roll you see that a lot. Um, and so it's kind of like relearning how a beat fits in to the song. Um, once you've got it though, you know, you, you guys like riding a bike, you can, you can figure it out. So I'll show you a few other songs and see if you can kind of pick up on the balance and I'll kind of showcase a few different drum beats. So this one is just a regular, what they call a straight beat. And you know, if you go to a powwow uh, over like the Pier in Sheridan at the Cody powwow, um, or uh, you know any place um, you'll see this is the most common style song. Um, most of the songs are like this and most of the dancing uh, occurs with songs like this and so any style of dance can, can see you know all ages um, you know and traditional fancy grass uh, all things in between.
structure of the psalms. The psalms have basically three parts. And every psalm of this style, there's really only three parts to them. And the first part is what we call a lead. And so if there's a group of guys singing around a drum, and usually with Northern Plains, this is kind of a guy thing, um, sitting at the drum. Uh, for most tribes, the women will stand behind them and sing at an octave higher. And so, you know, the men are kind of singing down here and the women are a little bit higher. And, um, and it sounds really good uh, when you have a harmony going. But, um, so the first part of the song is sang by the lead singer. So for that song that I just sang, the first part goes like this. That's it. Now, if you were sitting around a drum and the lead singer started that. Right, as soon as that finishes up, then the, uh, everyone chimes in and they repeat that. And then the second part is it takes that phrase, that first phrase, and it just extends it on out until it kind of comes to a conclusion. And that's the second part. Then the third part is it takes it from the top again, or not from the top, but it repeats the second part again. So, um, you have your lead, which takes you into the first part, or the second part, <laughs> I'm sorry. And then as soon as that chorus is finished, you go into the third part, which is just the second chorus. And the, one of the things about these songs that makes them so powerful is that as soon as you finish up that second chorus, as soon as you finish up you know, the third part of the song, and the drum beat starts to pick up, you can either end right there, and then it's an awesome ending, or you can amp it up and like go into the next uh, round of singing. <laughs> so um, there's a lot of uh, energy there, like kinetic energy with the way the drum interacts with the voice. So I'll, I'll break that song down for you for the three parts. So again, the first part. <laughs> then the first chorus. to like take a deep breath and fire off into a new <laughs> chorus and that makes everybody you know and then and then if you're standing around watching it oh, that's the timer. <laughs> if you're standing around watching it you can just feel it I mean it's very very it's like a little nuclear explosion or something going on and then with the dancers and all the, the bells bouncing and the feathers uh, it's kind of an electrifying it's an addictive kind of an experience when you become a singer or a dancer. It's something that you enjoy doing because uh, it's a healing. There's a healing that happens there, and um, it's a you know, real happiness to be doing something that's uh, healthy and um, allows you to release emotions. You know, these songs, because there's no words in a lot of them, there are songs with words in them. And I think of, you know, 
pretty much every veteran song has words. And, and there's veteran songs sang at every powwow. And so uh, all the veteran songs talk about the different wars and you know, what, how important it is to be a warrior and stuff like that. Um, but uh, <clears throat> just, you know, being able to express yourself with your voice and not have any words in there. It's like almost like, like an, on a guitar, you know, where you see guys or women or whoever playing a guitar or a piano and they can use that instrument to just express emotions. That's what this style of music does with your voice. So you can express things that are not maybe necessarily uh, articulated with words, but very much understood uh, within the context of the human condition and uh, how all of us um, can appreciate you know, art in all of its different forms. So I'm going to pause there and uh, open it up for questions. <clears throat> Is that rawhide? Yes, actually, this is rawhide. Uh, this is elk. So uh, my uncle, uh, he's really good. You know, he gets the elk hides, he soaks them. He's got his technique for cutting them. Uh, he's just really a, a true professional at it. It just always looks so neat and tidy. And um, you know, when I try to to do these, uh, I've really struggled. And uh, I decided it wasn't for me. And you know, I mean, uh, for one thing, it doesn't smell that great. <laughs> You've got an animal hide soaking in water. You, know, you probably don't want to have that in your house. Uh, you don't want to really have it outside because there's magpies and stuff out there too. So you're going to have like a workspace where you can soak hides. You can have the tools. And then you want to, it's just, I think he does it, it's a labor of love, right? something that he enjoys doing, that uh, he's made so many drums over the course of his life that, um, you know, when he's gone, you know, his drums will live on. And they're kind of like Stradivarius uh, violins, a lot of them, because they just sound so good. And, uh, and it's hard to find drums that just look that neat. You see a lot of them, they got a lot of twine all wrapped up in there. And, it's like maybe that was their first time making a drum. <laughs> you know, uh, this guy looks like uh, artificial intelligence designed it on some kind of a 3D uh, printer and had it turned out, you know, I mean, like almost flawless. And the flaws are like perfect too, you know, like, oh, it's not quite, you know, perfectly shaped, but it's, you know, got to get an artistic flow about it. So yeah, thanks for asking. Now this year, is uh, an example of something that's brain tanned or tanned, you know, smoked, and, um, and that's the difference between the two uh, textiles. And, the, and there's processing that you have to do to, to make it nice and soft. I don't think bison hides are the best for drums, probably for a big floor drum, but for hand drums, I think elk was the preferred, and elk was preferred for like clothing, shirts and pants, and it's a little lighter and uh, easier to work with it. What is the string? Is it sinew? Yeah, yep, this is sinew. Yep. Yeah. How many songs do you know, and how long did it take you to learn them? Yeah, it's a, well, you know, um, hard to say how many songs I've known. Now, now, we used to sing all the time, uh, probably, you know, several hundred. Um, I, when I first started singing, it took me a long time to learn my first song. Um, I just couldn't hear it, you know. But then once I finally learned, I started, I can learn a song real quick now. In fact, I could probably sit down with the drum group and, you know, sing along with them and learn the song after after one time. I, I wouldn't be able to uh, then sit down and sing that song by myself through my memory, but I would be able to sit with guys that know that song and help them sing it. So um, 
So there's different aspects to it. And so that's the difference between like a, a singer and a lead singer. So my uncle, you know, Conrad Fisher, he, uh, he makes these drums, he's also a lead singer. So he has all the songs in, in his memory. Um, so if you want to set up, for example, at a powwow, and you want to sing at a powwow, you have to have a whole bunch of songs in your repertoire because you don't know what you're going to be called on to sing. So you might ask to get sing a traditional song, you might ask to get sing a double beat, you might ask to um, get sing an honor song. Um, and so you really want to make sure you're prepared and have a whole bunch of songs on deck if you're going to be singing at a powwow. <laughs> and then if you're going to be a host drum, and so a host drum is the drum that you know kind of takes the big responsibilities throughout the powwow for the big songs, you know, the grand entry songs, the closing songs, the big honor songs. If those guys get paid a lot of money, those guys know hundreds of songs. And they practice all the time, they're professionals. A lot of, most post drums probably write their own songs and make their own songs as well. Um, and they keep their voices in shape because if you're going to sing at a powwow and be a host drum, you'll probably have to sing between you know 25 and 30 songs that weekend, and it's going to be hard on your voice. Mm -hmm. you're, just going to, you're going to be asked to really be loud by Saturday night or Sunday or whatever. Your voice will start to wear out if you're not if you don't have it in shape. And so um, those, and then for someone like me who uh, I don't really sing at powwows too much anymore. Um, the drum group that I used to sing with at Bozeman, you know, they've kind of disbanded. And uh, so I'm not involved, as involved as I used to be. So I, I like this music and when I go to Powell's, I, my kids dance. And I like to uh, jump in with the drum group and sing. But, um, but I'm not a uh, professional singer by any means or a tourer. But I do enjoy and uh, sing songs for groups like this. Yeah. How old were you when you started singing? <laughs> I started singing when I was 16. Yep, and uh, I just, it was just so cool, you know. Um, I sat down at the drum, that's the first time I sat down at the drum and saw my uncle singing and I was just really compelled. I, I was kind of amazed. I couldn't believe how good he sounded. I had no idea in my mind, like what he was doing, and I told him, you know, I want to, I want to uh, learn how to sing. And he said, Ah, you don't, you don't have the patience for it. You want to go drive around and go play basketball. <laughs> if you want to learn how to sing, you have to sit at the drum, and you have to be patient. So he was kind of challenging me, and I, and, but I took the challenge, and I said, Yeah, I want to do that. And that, and then when I sat there. So at the drum, like I said, at Bozeman, we had uh, members from every reservation. So I learned not just about the songs, but I learned so much more uh, about tribal community, about humor, about respect. Um, just, you know, I mean, I couldn't even tell you how much I learned sitting at the drum. Like, and I think many uh, band members could probably say the same about their musical experience, what they learn from being part of a band, what what works, what doesn't, why do some bands succeed and stay together and others don't? You know that I think that's kind of across the board universal themes. Yeah, did you have? Uh, are you from, uh, fluent in any Native American tongues? And if you are, could you give us an example? Yeah, I'm not fluent in the Crow language. Uh, I know a lot of words. Um, you know, uh, it's it's a kind of language I think most people, when they really make an effort and they live in the community, they've learned how to speak it because most of the sounds are in the English alphabet. And if you look at how the Crow language has been alphabetized, it uses the English alphabet and there's maybe only like one or two sounds that are not in the English alphabet and, and they're in the German language like that sound, weak, or tongue. You know. So like uh, Crow Agency, 
Would that be pronounced Bakhshi? Is it something? Bakhwaja. Bakhwaja. Yeah, that means house that shakes. Uh, and it comes from when they first built, when they first established the agency there, they had a uh, flour mill. And they would take the uh, um, wheat in there and shake it to make flour. So that's where that name comes from, house that shakes. And uh, Aja, Aja uh, is a word for house. So, yeah, good question, yeah. Um, last month, someone died and left me their drum. Oh, wow. Um, and it looks like that, and it has the star on the back. And I, oh, just, wow. keep, I just keep looking at it. And I don't know what to do. I mean, it's like, do I take sure it's drum the lessons? Or <laughs> what, how do I approach this instrument that is just in my room looking at me? Yeah, I'd say just take your time and you'll figure it out. <laughs> you know, if, it's, if it has a star on the back, my uncle probably made it because I don't know of any other people that make those kind wow, of drums. Okay. But yeah, if, I, if you could take a picture and let me know. And then I think just like I said, just think about it. You know, maybe maybe you want to keep it and give it to someone in your family, or maybe you want to go to a powwow and give it away to somebody this summer, or maybe you want to hold on to it for ten years, or maybe you want to take it to Antiques Roadshow. And <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I I I think it's up to you. But good question. Yeah. Hi. Um. I was really fascinated by how you talk about the high and low pitches yeah. of the voice. Yeah. What about the pitch of the drum? Does that play into it at all? Oh yeah, I mean you want to have a drum that's even toned. If it's too tight then it gets high, yeah. it doesn't really sound good, it's kind of tinny. Mm -hmm. If it's too low, mm -hmm. you know, I mean it's kind of... So the, the actual the maker of the drum, do they have a mind? Do they fashion the drum for a certain pitch or yeah. something that can be changed? Yeah, they do. They do, like my uncle, like, most of his drums sound about like that. Now this is a good tone because um, if you're a man, you know your voice can fit in that range. Too. And I, for most Northern Plain style songs, uh, they have a higher pitch. And uh, if you go down to Oklahoma, the Southern Plains songs are lower pitch. But I think one of the things I wanted to emphasize before my presentation is up, and it's 11:30, is that um, this style of music started off kind of like being popularized by the Buffalo Bill Cody Wild West show and a few other um, tourist traps. But within a generation or two, it kind of swept the nation. And now if you go to a powwow, whether it's in New York or Florida, or California or New Mexico, they're going to be playing this kind of music and they're going to be doing a lot of the dances that came from this area. And that, I think, is still a mystery. I think it's still hard to explain why this style just kind of Swap the nation, but again, it's like rock and roll. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. One last question. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm just so intrigued by the fact there are no words. It's just I know. sounds, and I, it is. to me, that would make it so hard for somebody to learn how to just sing together. It really is, but when you get it going, it's a pretty special feeling. <laughs> Thank you so much. Again.